Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Today, we're diving into the world of sleep with our special guest, Dr. Kathy Goldstein, a distinguished neurologist and sleep expert from the University of Michigan's Sleep Disorders Center. Today, we'll be discussing the intriguing concept of sleep debt, which is the amount of sleep someone needs versus what they're actually getting. The impact of sleep deprivation on our health and productivity and how you can leverage strategic napping to boost your performance. So whether you're a busy parent, a professional, or anyone interested in optimizing your sleep for better health and performance, this episode is packed with insights you will not want to miss. So let's go ahead and lean in and learn from the best. Kathy, I'm a busy parent. I got three boys. One's three years old, so I got 11, seven, and three. Sometimes things don't go as planned. You're up late at night. You're having to take care of them. You don't get enough sleep. So it puts me in sleep debt. What is sleep debt? And is it something that we can pay back? Yeah. So this interesting idea of sleep debt is kind of this hole that we grow by night to night to night, not getting enough sleep. And the typical pattern that I see among my patients, but also just friends and kind of everyone I meet is that everyone is somewhat shortchanged on sleep during the weekdays. So they're spending six, seven and a half hours time in bed, and we're not perfectly efficient sleepers, right? So we're going to spend about 85 to 90% of our time in bed asleep. So that means we're definitely falling short of that recommended eight hours. And then on the weekends, people say, well, it's okay. I'll just sleep a little longer to repay my sleep debt. And the problem is that is not really a debt that you can repay um, for a few different reasons. So firstly, like just math, right? So if you are shortchanging yourself by, you know, an hour, hour and a half, five nights a week, you know, sleeping in for an hour on Saturday and Sunday, it just, it doesn't add up literally, right? So there's that. But the other thing that's really important about sleep is it's not just this kind of linear, simple process. It's a more dynamic process. And sleep is controlled by what we call a two-process model. It's controlled by your homeostatic sleep drive, which means that the longer you're awake, the more your homeostatic sleep drive increases and makes it easier to fall and stay asleep. And then your circadian rhythm, which is your internal biological clock, which promotes sleep during a very specific part of time in the night. And so you have a limited amount of time for high quality, good, consolidated sleep in a 24-hour day. So you can't really keep extending and extending that period when you have the time to make up for those daily losses. So it's really, really adding time during the week and being consistent that's going to prevent you from forming the sleep debt anyway. Very interesting. So I'm trying to speak to all these busy parents out there. So if we can't really pay it back, what happens? Are we in internal debt? Is this a MasterCard bill we can't pay back? Yeah, it's hard to know the long-term consequences just because of biological variability. Everybody has a different amount of sleep that we they need. So when we study and research things and averages and we see things that not getting enough sleep can add to increased risk of obesity, heart disease, mortality risk, you know, those are real risks, but we don't fully understand kind of the magnitude, how much sleep loss does it take to cause those things? It's hard to know, but what we do know is that you're really going to be continuously impaired. And the more sleep deprived mm. people are, the less they recognize that impairment. And that impairment isn't resolved just by a couple of nights of longer sleep. So that's really, you know, the most immediate consequence of that debt. And then the biggest thing, you know, people tell me, they say, oh, well, I don't have time to sleep. And when you cut your sleep short for this whole idea of you don't have time because you're so busy, et cetera, et cetera, you're really losing time because you're not as efficient. You do things like cyber loafing, your decision-making is impaired, your executive function is impaired. 
And when you're awake for 16 consecutive hours, that is like being legally intoxicated. So devote the time to sleep and you're gonna get some time back anyway in how productive and effective you are. If you're a busy person looking for actionable tips to help you look, feel, and perform better, then check out my newsletter, Adaptation. Every Friday, I send this newsletter to over a thousand busy people just like you who are looking to improve their health and wellness but don't have time for a crazy download of information. My newsletter, Adaptation, is short and to the point, and I provide you with actionable recommendations curated from the latest scientific literature, along with decision-making frameworks to help you lead yourself better. If you're interested, sign up now. The link is in the show notes. Amazing. I love this. So we've had three kids, right? There are periods of time where like my spouse or I are just like, you know, you're not going to get enough sleep because somebody's going to have to be up with the baby. And then it's like, okay, now the child's sleeping through the night and it takes maybe a month or two to kind of get back to feeling normal. I guess what I keep digging at here is, is I've never really seen a resolution to this question and I'm no longer in an academic environment. I still keep up on the literature, but it's like, there has to be like, there's, you know what I'm talking about? Where like you go from zombie and you're like, oh, I feel normal again. Yeah. Is that mean that the debt's paid back? You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like if you overexert yourself physically, there's a cost to adaptation. There's an allostatic load. And then if you can refill the tank, then your body can eventually heal itself. Right. And I think of it more, not necessarily as kind of resolving this prior debt, But more again, that this is a dynamic process and you are now sufficiently, like you said, filling your tank for the days that follow. Because we don't really know how long it takes. I mean, there's some evidence that 14 days people are still impaired, right? So it's hard to have a strict cutoff. One of the things you can do, particularly if you know you're going into a difficult time, is you can start a savings account. And we know like when we take medical trainees that are going to be kept up all night, if they really pad their sleep before in preparation for sleep loss, there seems to be um, the creation of some degree of reserve that can help with this problem. But that being said, consistency really is key here because we know that these drastic changes in sleep duration and sleep timing really are not good for your health. And individuals that try and pay that sleep debt back every weekend, there is metabolic dysfunction that's been seen even in the short term. You're referring to social jet lag here? Yes. So social jet lag, this is, we call it social jet lag and almost everyone has it. So social jet lag is when you delay your sleep-wake timing. So you make it later by at least two hours on the weekends than the weekdays. So if you're somebody who has to get up for work at 6 a.m. and then it comes Friday night, you say, well, I'm going to stay up a little bit. I'm, I want to stay up late. I've been really good about my sleep. So you stay up late, sleep until nine, and then you sleep until nine, Saturday morning, Sunday morning. Here's what happens. Our internal biological clock is longer than 24 hours. So it's easier to fall asleep later and wake up later and biologically adjust to that than it is to go the opposite way. So you can make your internal clock physically make it later over the course of just two days. And then what happens is if you've been sleeping in till 9 a.m. and you have to wake up at 6 a.m. on Monday, it's essentially like you're flying back from L.A. to New York and you're going to have difficulty falling asleep Sunday night. You're going to have a shorter sleep period. And so you're going to be sleep deprived on Monday and also have a harder time getting out of bed. And that's social jet lag, which has been associated with health issues, poor performance in school, something that ideally we would avoid. Absolutely. hundred percent. So let's say I keep going back to these parents that are having kids because I get this all the time, right? Well, thank you for telling me about the ideal world when I have a baby, right? Or whatever. What do you think about naps and kind of our, you know, how we can leverage those? Let's say we're doing everything we can, right? We're not trying to abuse our bodies, And um, we're going to bed at a good time, but things are happening, whatever those circumstances might be. How would you leverage a nap to kind of like boost your physical and cognitive performance? 
Absolutely. So I can tell you already, I feel like you already know the answer to this. (laughs) So naps have been well demonstrated to kind of bring that cognitive and physical performance back up to baseline in the face of sleep deprivation. 30 to 60 minutes, especially you might want to keep it closer to 30 minutes to avoid something called sleep inertia, which is this grogginess when you have difficulty transitioning out of the sleep period into the wake period. But these naps really can, what they're doing is we talked about that homeostatic sleep drive that builds and builds and builds with accumulated wakefulness. And the reason it builds is it's an accumulation of adenosine when the cells are too tired to phosphorylate adenosine into ATP. So you get this buildup and that's what makes you sleepy. And by taking a nap, you dissipate that homeostatic sleep drive. So even a 30 minute nap And I like to time this kind of after lunch because you get that sedating effect of food or in the afternoon when you're having this, what we call circadian dip in your alertness. These are great times to take a nap to really restore performance so you can make it through the rest of your day. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This has been really informative and practical for our audience. Thanks again for listening to the Blueprint Podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, if you love the show, do me a favor, leave us a comment and review on whichever listening platform you are joining us from as this is going to help us grow and reach more people with the message of the Blueprint. Thanks again for listening and I'll catch you on the next episode.